Greetings, everybody, and welcome to the sound check. Greetings, everybody, and welcome to the sound check. Sounds okay to me. All right, we are live. Let's go to Twitter for a second. Let folks know. Tweeted. I have now tweeted, folks. It has been done. Here, go to games. Let's open up some more of them here. I'm going to try and keep them all open today. Keep a normal chess analysis board up just so I can illustrate some opening principles here and there with positions that'll be familiar to people. Gamer. And let's go for Gukesh versus Fabi here on the last board. You hope for the world champ to do something today. So you want to see Ding versus Ding is going to play against um, Abdu Sadarov today, and Kamer is going to play against Aronian. Kamer and Aronian are the only ones who drew in the first round. Um, so greetings, everybody, and let's quickly go through our matchups for today. You can see below me I have added high production value. It's been a while since we've been doing any serious commentary here. We've got a collar on the shirt and a graphic. And you can see the match scores there. Maybe it's too small to see. Let me know if that's the case. Um, so, uh, Noderbeck uh, versus Ding. You can see in the bracket, the winner of that match will play the winner of the Ali Reza versus Magnus matchup below that. Fabi versus Gukesh below that. And then Kamer versus Aronian. And the winners of those two matches will play each other. Um... Yeah, and Abdul is thinking that Ding is going to do something today, but I I will be surprised. I will be surprised if Ding does does uh does much of anything here. I think to me all eyes should be on Magnus cuz they've got this goat challenge going on and he's about to get eliminated in the very first round, right? So it's like what are you going to do about that Magnus? Can you take out Ferruja or no? Uh, where is Kostya? Couldn't he get up this early? It's 6 a.m. for Kostya. It's very, very early. But I'll send him a message anyway, you know, just to just to see.
Ooh, I hear the sound of moves. All right, message has been sent, folks. Did what I could. Um, all right, what else we got? Gka says, yesterday was interesting, but also a bit of a damp squib, considering the advantage White started with. Um, so I think what Gka is saying is that the position uh, from yesterday's games was advantageous to White from the outset. And I have not deeply analyzed the starting position from yesterday. I just played through the games. But my first impression was that, yes, it was a nice starting position for White yesterday. Um, and I felt like the three games that White won, all three of them, White got a nice position out of the opening. Fabi versus Gukesh was the hardest for me to be certain of. Uh, the evaluation. I think Fabi, and I, I could definitely be wrong on this one, but I think that Fabi had a nice position in the early opening, then the position got closer to equal, and then he re outplayed Gukesh in the middle game. I feel like that was a middle game win. Um, but I think. If I've got you correct all also, I think you're saying damp squib kind of like a bad thing. Like because White had some advantage, the games weren't interesting, right? Um But uh I thought to me the games were still very interesting. And Ali Reza really Played, to my mind, a very original maneuver, rook b3 to a3 to c3, right in the endgame. That weird rook lift with his b-pawn advance and the a and c-pawns backwards, that was an original maneuver that you won't see often a, a comparable to in classical chess or old classical chess um, because you wouldn't normally have like the B-pawn advance without the A or the C-pawns, right? Because it's it makes so many weaknesses on the A and C files. So it's weird to have one pawn super far advanced compared to the others. So to me, that was kind of like an impressive maneuver. It was clear he had an advantage in the end game with all kinds of moves. But that maneuver, which I wouldn't have found, um, really showed the extent of his advantage went from like a very nice position to a pawn up plus a nice position. So I think that was super informative and a sign of very, very good form for Ferruja. Just just my take on it. And again, I'm not 2700 level, so I can't, or 2800 level like these guys, like some of them. So I can't, you know, assess everything at, at a top level. Everything I say, you have to take with, with a, with a, you know, some, some grains of salt that it's within the capabilities of a, you know, 23 to 2400 level player. Um, but that, that was sort of my take on that. And let's see what Magnus can do today um, with this position. It's nice when we can see the positions a few minutes before they move because we can start talking about the position. I love to help everybody to... Um, to look at how I look at the first like couple moves of the game and figure out how to start off the game. But we're gonna just dive right in here with uh, Carlson versus Ferruja and we'll click around and see some of the other games as well. Uh, if anyone has any questions about the format or whatever, you can chime them in when you need to, but the moves are already coming, so I'm gonna get into the games and then interrupt myself as needed throughout. But you can also see below I've put some information in like a banner about like the time control, why the pieces are messed up, how many games they're playing, that sort of thing. And uh, let me know if you can read the uh, the bracket that I have or if that's so small that it's not even worth having, but it should show who's playing against who and what the current scores are. So you can see who's in the lead in which match and who needs to win to force a tie break or not. Um, and that said, let's get into this position. So um, I'm going to back up two moves just to let you see this. Uh, and I'm going to tell you guys one of the first things I look at um, in general, or I think not even the first things, one of the things that really guides me in deciding what to do 
in Fisher Random Chess is where the bishops are. That's uh, that guides how I play the position more than where the rooks are, the kings, the knights, the queens. It's the bishops more than anything else. Um, there's several reasons for that, which we can get into more and more as we look at more games. But uh, for now, let's look at one example. We've got bishops on g8 and h8 and g1 and h1. And to me, this immediately says the bishops are far more likely to aim at the, sorry, I don't have a mouse anymore, at the queen side than at the king side. This is going to be annoying to not have a mouse. Um, <laughs> my setup in France is getting worse instead of better. Who would have thought that was possible? Um, so in this, in this opening position, you're going to have a very strong incentive to castle king side and avoid getting your king uh, either castling queen side or getting stuck in the center. Very, very strong incentive to try and get to the king side if you can, which means looking to develop these two pieces. Um, and well, one of the things I like least in Fisher Random is when there's a bishop in the corner because we know that you have to develop it on this diagonal. So you're going to have to move the G pawn in this game, no other way around it, and your opponent's going to have to do the same. Uh, this bishop has two choices. It could go this way or this way. Um, but if you're white from the outset, you would rather move the F pawn to control the center than move the H pawn and then move the bishop to H2, I think. So... Uh, the desirable structure for white, if you got to do everything you wanted to, is you'd play these three moves. This would be the equivalent of, you know in normal chess, if you if you were playing a beginner like Morphia always did, and you were and your opponent were playing like h6, a6, b6, what would you do? In classical chess or old chess, you would play e4, d4, right? And then if you wanted to, c4 or f4, and then you would put your knights on c3 and f3, okay? Well, here what you would like to do if you were given a bit of freedom is you would set up these three moves first. That ensures that your bishops are having the maximum scope along with good central control for the pawn structure. And from there, you'd be, you know, it would depend on what your opponent does, but if they let you, you would play d4 as well um, and then bring this knight here out to b3 or d3 i don't know for sure this bishop would definitely just go to f2 to allow kingside castling and stay tucked away and this knight would probably go to e3 so that's kind of like the dream of what you want to do and you've got a huge decision on move one you can play e4 hoping to play f4 next move but giving your opponent the chance to play e5 and prevent you and notice that black has you know knight e6 or g6 um probably not g6 because of the bishop right so that's why I say 96 first, and possibly g5 to really clamp down on it. So you could get into a closed position this way, or you could play f4, right? Dealing with that e5, and then you've got the hanging pawn, but, sorry, you've got the hanging pawn on f4, but you have the possibility of advancing e4 more easily. Why is it easier to advance e4? You've got the rook behind it and the bishop behind it. It's like the difference between e4 and d4 in normal chess, right? Only here you want to play e4 and f4, not e4 and d4. You have a choice between advancing the safe pawn that's going to be already protected very well by your rook and bishop. And look at what Magnus does, right? His pawn, it's super well protected. And it's likely you've got a chance of having more maneuvering kind of, you know, London's, Tories, that kind of a style of a game, collie systems, more likely with e4 right because it's going to be a little bit harder to advance f4 or you can play f4 and then you've got a very very good chance that you'll be able to advance e4 later and that would be like playing e4 in normal chess and it's hard for black to prevent d4 right if you think of all the e4 openings is there like any opening where black prevents white from following up with d4 no there's openings where black you know prepares to trade upon but after e4 you can't prevent white from playing d4 so similarly here, if Magnus played f4, most likely black can't prevent white from following up with e4 at some point, right? So you're expecting to get this kind of a, a structure if you start with f4, okay? Which is a little bit more open, right? More of like a 
a French or a Sicilian or something like that, right? Whereas if you play e4, like Magnus did, you've got a good chance, um, Frugia didn't play this, but you've got a good chance of meeting something like knight e6, clamping down on these squares, right? And then you can't, uh, you can't push the tempo in the same way you get more of a maneuvering game. Does that all make sense? So Magnus chose the more like d4 style move here compared to normal chess. Let's quickly see what first moves the others picked, okay? We had f4 from Gukesh and f5, g3, g6. So this much is something I just anticipated. And then c3, which lets the queen out and blunts this bishop. It's logical. It can also be to play bishop d4 and weaken the opponent's dark squares and play like a longer maneuvering game with that. Um, uh, and it can be to, you know, play d4 and e4 and get him Roxy bind, but flipped, right? But the surprising move is this one here, which, okay, first blush, I don't get it, therefore I guess it's terrible. <laughs> that said, not only are these players much better than me at old chess and potentially much better than me at every part of chess 960. But also chess 960 is difficult enough that all of us are capable of like completely missing the point of a move on move three or four from another master and being totally wrong about what we think at first. You know, this happened multiple times to me on Friday when I was commenting. So anyone who was watching that first round, those first rounds with me on Friday will will remember that there were times where I said, oh, this should be great positionally. And there was, you know, some little tactical pattern that's different than normal chess that that made it not work. But B4, I don't see, I don't see the point of. And Fabi's played a move which also is slightly surprising to me. D5, just clamping. I guess that's because he's black. It makes more sense. And he's a game up. He has a one-point advantage. So actually, it's a very safe move and it makes sense to me. If you really thought this move were bad and you needed to win with black, you would try to take advantage of it with the move e5, right? That's the move that stands out to me as a way to try and prove, or as a way to try and take over an advantage in the game at some point. But okay, he plays d5, kind of clamping e4, slowing down the game, and his position looks quite safe um, to start with. Let's see what Ding played on move one, e4, e5, g3, g6. Kind of like the Magnus game, but um, Ferruja had played c6, controlling f4 with the queen. Nodirbeck plays g6, so he doesn't immediately, obviously, prevent f4, does he? No. I mean, Nodirbeck might be thinking that, you know, with just a move like this, it's so awkward for white to deal with that undefended pawn that this might be something he's... Uh, looking forward to also playing g takes f4 makes you less pumped about bringing your king here even though that's sort of where you still have to bring your king so maybe there's some dynamism here for black while white has put you know effort into building the pawn center anyway ding played c3 first uh you know just giving some coordination to the queen etc Let's see what Aronian started with. D4, F5, C3. So he, I mean, the way Aronian's playing this bishop's going to be a little bit awkward because he's put this pawn on D4. He doesn't have a great way to get this, to get both these bishops out. I suppose the best way I see to use the position he has right now so far is H3 and G4. Uh, I don't know what that's called, G4 against the Dutch. But it can be played g4 as a sack, followed by h3, which won't be the case here since white has no piece defending h3. But you can also play d4, f5, h3. And then just play g4 on the second, uh, on the third move. Um, that's the only thing that to me would really make sense of Aronian's start here. Vincent, of course, playing more like my sort of assumption of how you want to uh, start your pawns with this bishop pair in the corner and uh, knight d2 which can both 
suggests that he might play e4 next and could be just part of you know developing and getting the king over here as soon as possible um which looks fine i mean white's position looks looks fine as well c3 d4 should be playable uh even if it's not like putting a ton of pressure on the opponent so we had two e4s one f4 and one d4 and now we've got symmetry here after g6 by Ferugia and Magnus is having a real think. I bet it does foos. Like everything on chess.com has names. In fact, we could go find it out right here, couldn't we? D4, F5, H3, Korchnoi attack. Korchnoi attack, Janzen, Korchnoi gambit, if we play g4 anyway here, which is the point of h3. I mean, what else are you going to do at this point? Say, oh, you prevented g4. I'll go back to, like, you know, playing knight f3. <laughs> Korchnoi, Janzen, Korchnoi gambit. I'd never heard that name before. That's not what I remembered hearing. All right. Magnus brings the knight to e3, sort of stopping black from playing d5 or f5, but not really advancing his pawn breaks yet. So what's he going to want to do from here? Maybe put his knight on e2 to eventually try to play d4, f4 with that knight. There's symmetry for a bit. I hope Magnus is enjoying this chance to play Chess 960 Classical that he was so hyped about, even though he's not winning the event. I think winning is one of the things that he enjoys <laughs> about chess. So, you know, even though Chess 960 is better, he might enjoy it less if it's losing at Chess 960 versus winning at normal chess. <laughs> Yeah, that makes sense. Makes total sense. As black, you want to slow it down so the tempo you're down means less and less, right? Uh, you know, it's already to a point where I would think that the position is very, very close to equal, would be my guess looking at this. I think Magnus's setup hasn't produced any special dynamism very, very much. Um, or very minimal chances of a noticeable opening advantage for white at this point. That's my take on his game. Um, yeah, I guess they, they played the opening slower than in class than than in old chess, which makes sense. They don't know what's going on, so it gives us a little more time to talk about what's going on and even to follow more than one game. Which is which is interesting. Ooh, there's the move I mentioned from Gukesh, this idea of bishop d4 clamping dark squares. And the move d5 kind of opened up to this, right? Because now Fabi doesn't have a comparable maneuver to neutralize it. Like on this move, I thought, yeah, it's an idea, but it's not like a super impressive idea because black can kind of do the same thing, right? But b4, I don't know what it was about, but after d5, this bishop d4 move looks quite logical, actually, just looking for some kind of small maneuvering advantage off of having the better bishop in the resulting structure. Also, maybe black needs to play bishop f6, actually, but we could argue that if black takes that having the only semi-open file on the board will be another advantage for white, right? Like playing c takes d4, bringing that c pawn into the center. I know double pawns, you know, we often think of them as being slightly bad, but the very first doubled pawn conferring on one player the only half-open file on the board, generally that's a pretty nice thing. Like you actively want that. Looking at this position, because he's played this weird b4 move, you know, black might be able to strike back against the queen side with a5 and find some weak squares. Um, so that's 
a concern, but maybe a5, b5 is fine for Gukesh. Otherwise, you know, you give Gukesh time to play knight d3, knight e3, castle king side, and his position is going to be pleasant. I see all kinds of plans for him. Um, I mean, you know, Fabi may come up with an idea that we haven't noticed in 30 seconds here, but the first feeling is that if bishop d4, cd4, high chance that there's a, a, a noticeable advantage for white, right? Something tangible that you can start building on. Um, Gcat also thinking maybe bishop f6 would be the better option, not giving that uh, file. And if white takes on f6, then it's black <laughs> who gets that uh, who gets that benefit of the only half open file uh, while covering the weakness on e5 to keep knights out of it. So bishop f6, I mean, it's a whole tempo and it's somewhat rare that you spend a whole tempo in the opening on something random, but the position's locked and it's a major, it's a pretty noticeable positional difference, you know? So yeah, it seems like bishop f6 should be played. Ding, very calm with queen c2. And Noderbeck plays the more aggressive move considering d5 or f5 for himself first versus knight e6, which is the more defensive move trying to prevent white's pushes. So... Um, I mean, Noderbeck's up a game. He doesn't need to push too hard, but I'm sure he's going to be feeling pretty confident in this game. I mean, he can't help but feel some confidence as the top seed against the bottom seed, having won the rapid section while, you know, and playing an opponent who has not won a game yet at this event. I think you'd have to be pretty, pretty confident. Uh, in Noderbeck's shoes, even if you try to say, you know, every game is a new is a new game and let's take each game on its own. So Abdul is asking, how about a concrete variation just to start evaluating something, right? What can we say about this position, knight d6, b takes c. White can also play a4 here, but let's, let's continue uh, Abdul's line. Also, black could throw in the move knight e6 and just see how white wants to defend this pawn, but um, let's just go with Abdul's line. Now you play queen b8. I'm gonna have to stop your line here, Abdul, because why would we give the b file here? Queen b8, rook b8, and our rook is trapped. That move is just too implausible. So I'm gonna stop your variation here. We're just gonna say like, what do we think of this position here? In general, white should have a dramatic advantage, right? C6 pawn looks terrible. Dark square pawn structure for white, light squared pawn structure for black, with light squared bishops on the board. Um, you know, both bishops are kind of bad because the center is locked. Um, I'm concerned that white has an issue with the knight and the pawn both needing the e3 square. So that's definitely something tricky to solve. Um, and a little bit annoying for white, but it should be a major advantage. I'm thinking. Yeah, although I don't see the solution to this puzzle of who gets to go through e3. So. Oh, Fabi played another candidate move we hadn't even considered e5. Yeah, totally playable. Totally playable. Um, I don't know what you mean by not important, Abdul. It seems to me like until black plays c5 and trades that pawn, any position like this, this pawn is bad. Okay, so Fabi does something much more proactive than bishop f6. 
Interesting. I mean, bishop f6 seemed sufficient, right? Like, I didn't think black really looked like they were worse after bishop f6. It seems sufficient. He goes for e5. And, um, well, Gukesh probably has to take, I would imagine. If he retreats, that no, that would be a horrible sign. He's got to take. The bishop will take. Then maybe trade. Queen takes. Knight d3. He's moved. Or I think there's been a move. He traded with the bishop first. Okay, so he's definitely going for that variation. So he's threatening d4 now, so I... We vaguely assume it's queen e5, knight d3. So black's light squared bishop is a little bit worse here, but to compensate for that incredible space in the center, better prospects for the black queen. The white queen doesn't have any obvious angles on the game yet. Yeah, it looks, looks like a great solution from Fabi as well, what he's come up with here. Magnus plays 92, of course. Magnus and Ferruger are playing this game a little bit slowly but they must be calculating some of these f5 and f4 breaks every move um which is taking some energy yeah that's an important point about the stonewall foos that um one bishop is bad the other is not that much better at first hey pepper picante um but this bishop is noticeably worse than white's. It's noticeable. Um, yeah, but not much. Yeah, I think the comment does apply. I think the comment does apply, Foos. Yeah, it's like, obviously the g8 bishop is bad. The h1 is not that much better. Fair enough, fair enough. And yeah, I'm doing, I'm doing great right now, Pepper Picante. Pumped to be watching this. Uh, whoa, we've got some action from Noderbeck. He's pushing things with black, by the way, folks, only needing a draw. And look at him just bullying Ding. If um, if Fisher Random had a rating system, you know, you could say that he's like trying to farm him or something, going this aggressive with black when you're up a game in a two-game match. Um, is really, that's intense. Um, and Ding trades, he takes with the knight leaving a more intact kingside pawn structure if he castles there eventually and clamping down on the move d4 and the only move that really suggests itself as a move is f4 but i don't know if ding has the confidence to play a single aggressive move looks why is noderbeck's time running and i'm not seeing another move for ding He's castled queenside. Okay. Yeah, he didn't. He didn't go for f4. Now he's missed his chance, and Black's clearly better in seven moves. I think with either d5 or knight e6. Man. They say that Noderbeck is ice cold, don't they? That's really cool to just try and tear white apart like this. The thing is, Abdul, once black's played d5, if white ever plays f4, black can just play e4, right? And black's better. But he might also just want to get castle. Let's see, if he goes bishop takes a2, we have to remember this is Noderbeck. Like me, I'm always looking at, you know, controlling the center. 
But Noterbeck is a very, very concrete player, lots of calculations, and as we just said, ice cold. So he's going to look at like bishop takes a2, b3, and then double check his bishop's really trapped and that he doesn't have, you know, something sick to do. Like if his knight were already on e6 somehow, then he would calculate bishop a2, b3, knight c5, right? Attacking b3, queen a2, knight d3, check, that sort of thing. Okay, but he doesn't have bishop a2. But, you know, he might consider a5. It's vulnerable to bishop b6. Insane. Yeah. The thing is, Abdul Rahman, like, white should have played f4 here. Like, 100%, you know, it just looks like what you should do. Ding is really has played very, very passively. Like if you look at their first game from yesterday, let me, whoops, let me show you guys their game from yesterday. Just look at the opening of this game and how non-aggressively Ding played. Do you see that? He just like gave a pawn in like six moves for nothing. I guess you could call it aggressive from some perspective, but I mean, he just, I don't know, he just gave the thing up immediately with a queen trade, right? And then he just sat here and lost. Um, so, okay, he's played f4 in the game. Great. So queen c7 was Noterbeck's choice. That's saying Noterbeck's considering castling queenside quickly like Ding did. And now he gets an f4. I couldn't imagine what Ding would be protesting. I mean, I think he's just he's just not well. You know. So f4. Oh, but maybe he'll go queen a5 rather than castling. The first queen that gets to a4, a5 is a major advantage in this kind of position, right? Like if he castles here, then white has queen a4. how much I like pawns, so I probably hate what Ding did more than you. What what pawn are you thinking about, Abdul? So here's what I'm thinking. That Noderbeck's going to play queen here, leaving the central tension and saying like, oh, from the yesterday game, yeah. Oh yeah, that was, whew. Um, Yeah, I think he could argue that this would be really good for black, right? He's threatening bishop b3 <laughs> and the five pawn he'll white will probably have to stop bishop b3 and then he'll be up a pawn after he takes on e5 like like yesterday. <laughs> so I think queen a5 looks good. Queen a5 and if white spends a move on a3, now you can castle, right? And there may be a better move than castling, but you guys see my point that by getting your queen here instead of white's, you've got the more active piece and you've made the opponent create an extra weakness. So it would be like, it would be great. Okay, he's made a move. Let's see what he's played. Queen a5, yes! I feel like it's a good sign for Nodierbeck and myself if we agree on the move for black, right? When it's like unusual, complicated chess, you get that feeling like if somebody comes up with the same move as you, it's like a good sign for both of you. Like you, it's more likely that you're both onto the right idea. That's a strong move. I, I still think that, that Nodierbeck has the advantage uh, in this position, even though, you know, the first couple ideas I had here for him were d5 and knight e6. I think this idea of queen c7 just calmly and then if f4 here with an advantage. It's funny because 
If white plays a move like queen a4, then black just won't castle queenside, right? And this will be sort of a wasted tempo in other fights, right? There, black's going to play, you know, d5. Or maybe knight e6 first, just because knight c5 is a threat. Yeah, maybe knight, C, knight e6 first. Um, an extra worry for white, right? Trying to cover these squares. F4 is a pawn. Oh, is the queen defending F4? Could white play F4 here? Stopping knight c5, countering in the center. Yeah, I suppose f4 could be played. So then I'm not sure if knight e6 or d5 is better. But it's like a weird thing. The first person to castle gets hit by queen a5. So there's almost like an advantage here in delaying queen side castling because the queen a4, queen a5 move is super strong if your opponent castles and kind of a near wasted tempo if they don't. So, okay, so f4 got played, queen a5. And uh, yeah, Noderbeck looking very confident. Let's check another position. So knight d2, I thought he might play for e4, but I can see that it's Kamer who's played e5 by now. Knight d6. You know, played to mildly dissuade e4, but e4 could be played anyway. g3. And Kamer came faster than Levon here. Could Levon just play f4, uh, e4 here anyway? He could, seems. He may have calculated e4, f4, e4, knight e4, bishop d5, and been unhappy with something there. Because like this move doesn't look good for white. And that bishop's gonna be amazing in the resulting positions, I think, quite strong. Black has to get the queen out. I mean, there's there's a development problem for black here, but that bishop is amazing as long as nothing terrible is happening immediately. So obviously white doesn't have to trade on d6. They could play queen d3. Um, That looks a lot better. Yeah, queen d3 looks like it should be equal. I'm not really sure why it would, why white would be afraid of e4 based on what I'm seeing here. Hmm. Hey, PJ. Like here, 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 here. I feel like now if you take on h1, this knight is too good. But maybe you can take even here. Yeah, it feels like with these doubled pawns, black would be worse. If I go back, pepper picante. There's a knight check, like around here, knight f7. Yeah, there's a knight check, but how would the queen come in and give mate? 
all you have to do is retreat your knight. You're attacking with one knight all by itself, right? Now it's got to run. So we're just going to move the knight some extra times as white. You can't bring your queen out because the pawn's attacking the knight. Yeah, some kind of ghost. There's no there's no follow-up to this, right? The white queen is several steps away from a real attack. And it's just it's just not enough pieces to attack anything. Okay, so queen d3 was played. Of course you could be looking for e4 next move. And Vincent is deep in thought, being a bit of a I don't know, maybe perfectionist here. Working really hard on this next move. Queen d3 from Lafon. Actually, I see some strength to that move. It's setting up for e4 next move in a position where black doesn't have a lot of useful moves to wait. You know, So Vincent's e5 move was very, very aggressive. Very aggressive trying to get this in before white plays e4. And now it's hard for him to organize the knight f8 and bishop g8 while waiting for white to play e4 in a moment. The normal move here would be something like c6 developing the queen, but c6 bishop c5. And uh, you lose control. So Abdul even doesn't like the move before e5, the move knight d6 right here. Yeah, I guess he's just saying, you know, you go e4, you're going to have to trade a knight at least, so black's going to deal with their potential cramp. Um, a major alternative would have been d5, right? Trying to lock things up, like uh, Fabi played against Gukesh. Hmm... There's got to be some option other than d5. It can't be forced here. You can let white play e4 in various ways. But Abdul really unhappy with the knight getting awkward. And after lengthy thought, Vincent plays an ugly side pawn move here with a5. And his position is really not looking inspiring, actually, because now Levon could play a move like bishop c5 or bishop f2 or knight from c1 to b3. White's got any number of positional improving moves, even bishop g2. Like if all you can do is push the a pawn because you can't figure out how to develop knight f8 and bishop g8, well, white's got a million things to do. Meanwhile, um, so the early sense is that Vincent is in trouble out of the starting gate here. Let's see if Magnus has come up with anything. 92, 97, rook f1, rook f8. Okay, so he pushes for f4. Neither king can castle kingside, so that's already upping the excitement of this game because the kings really belong on g1 and g8. So rook f1, rook f8. I know the game looks like it started out like it was the most boring game uh, in the sense, right? Kind of like locked up e4 versus e5, neither player able to make a pawn break with d4 or f4. But now it's already promising some violence against the kings eventually. Symmetrical or not, you know, they're going to have to come to blows here. Magnus apologized. How do you know, Gka? Is that like a live... Uh, sort of confessional 
video that you've already seen from this game while it's happening? Abdul would be frustrated as white. Yeah, they've got live confessional. Okay. Yeah, I had a I had a bad feeling, G Ka, that Magnus had a bit of a had potentially a bad attitude around this. Um that's that's not what he should be saying. He should not be sitting here complaining about the format. The the thought entered my mind from very early on in this game, already around here, that uh that Magnus might be feeling like you know, yesterday he got a tough position as black and today he got a nothing position as white and he might be having negative thoughts of that kind, which are not going to help him to play this game and are not honestly that accurate either. The truth is he's already played the game badly on the first three moves and that's partly why he has that. And then the second thing to remember is throughout his career, he's won games from very, very equal and, and boring openings. You know, he hasn't played in the last you know 10 years he hasn't played a super high percentage of dynamic asymmetrical openings from the beginning right he's played a lot of e4 e5 and d4 d5 and out played his opponents and when he plays the Rui and the italian game he's not playing d4 in the opening you know he's playing d3 c3 castles knight d2 you know waiting around for his opportunities to eventually outplay an opponent and this position is no different than what he normally does. But I had this suspicion that he might be doing some negative self-talk and uh, you know, creating a bad narrative around complaining in his own head about this opening. And that, that comment um, that comment confirms my concern. Um, definitely with Rook F1, Rook F8 played, this game is going to be super exciting eventually. Um, and now he's played another move, F4. Okay, and he's first to the pawn break. Um, and Jika is saying that he was thinking about D5 for Ferruja here. So let's see what the idea might, might have been with the Rook still there. D5 takes... The knight on e6 is attacked. So he's probably thinking here, here. What would he do then? What is... Gcom might be able to tell us more of what Magnus said, but I'm going to try and, like, you know, figure out or understand why this is a plausible idea. Doesn't look like enough compensation to me at first blush. If you trade on d5, you can't go queen d6 because b7 is hanging. Um, you can't castle kingside much because it's just so slow to move this bishop. What you want to do is play like f5 with sort of spatial compensation, but I think you would start with this move, this move, and this move, honestly. Um, and then, okay, you're looking at maybe pressuring d2. So here, here. How, how can we castle? Nope. How do I castle here? It won't let me. Huh, I can't get it to let me castle here. Am I ever allowed to castle in a variation? Well, we'll, we'll find out later. Anyway, they should be able to long castle here. And, um, you know, I just don't see the compensation for black at all, is what I want to say about that. You know, D2 is defended. Black's not really preventing white from playing F4 themselves pretty soon. Uh, and white's up a pawn. I don't, I don't get it. I don't get it. And Gika says he didn't say much past 
ED5, CD5, Knight, D5, and he said he didn't know if it worked. Um, I'm sure he saw more to this than he said and has more like insights than that, but I certainly don't see it either. It looks looks really bad, like basically hanging upon. Um, can Ali Ressa play f5 in the game position and continue the copycat is Abdul's question. That's a very important question here. And the answer, we could calculate a lot to find it, but the answer is unlikely Abdul. Because most likely within a move or two, black won't be able to keep copying white if they do this much tension with f5. A bunch of trades happen and you just, you can't keep up with it. For example, I'll just show you one line. That's how long you could play copycat, right? Before resigning. Very, very short time. Once the pieces are capturing each other, it just doesn't work. You know, think of the trap in the Petrov and... Right, so here you'd, you'd be stopping your copycatting already, right? That said, I think the best move for white would be this one first, probably. And then if black does this, um, hmm. maybe it's not so clear. Oh my god, now the knight's out of the way, the bishop's covering that square. Sorry, I can't do it. I guess here, here, here. With the, the noted back theme that the queen could go to that square. And now white's got an advantage, they can castle, black can't. Knight f8 is a lost tempo. The black will have to catch up. Mm, certainly white is better by a little bit already. Nagging pull, simple variation. Not not too much, but something. Um, I would be very surprised by f5 here from black, but I haven't yet looked at what his other options are. He could go e takes f4 first. Let's say then knight f4. Five. Yeah, it feels a little second rate, I guess. I don't know. My my guess would be Black's under a little bit of of uh, of disadvantage now, probably. I'm just gonna do a quick look around, and maybe we'll calculate that more. But Gukesh after the trades on e5 got the little tempo, brought out the two knights. Fabi knight b6. Now white could castle kingside, but it won't let me. Interesting. Knight here, surprising move. Like you could say improving the knight to d4, but black just has knight e6 here, which seems like something black would be happy to play. And then I'm not sure why the knight went back to c2. Gukesh a bit lower on time as well here. Um, the clearest game was this one. Queen a5, b3. Vicious move, d5. Um, so you'd think white has to go fe5 here, but did not. It seems he's got to take, but he goes bishop g2. Castles, bishop h3. Hmm. I love Noderbeck, but it's a little bit hard to watch. Huh. 
Ai, ai, ai. And he plays like an ultimate aggressive move. D4, leaving the pawn hanging on F5. Trying to slam white in the center, expanding his rook's influence and block all these pieces out a little bit with his d4 pawn. Uh, super aggressive move. Uh, Noderbeck continuing to play basically the most aggressively possible. He's threatening d3, winning a piece as well. So not 10 million choices for white here. Uh, if white accepts the gambit on f5, it's obviously not good, I can say. I say obviously because it's it's not a very difficult calculation. A2 is hanging. If the queen goes to C2, D3 still wins a piece. So now you have to go here. Um, and now you could go D3. Even without the queen on C2, the knight is trapped. And black has won a piece. Although he might not even take that piece. He might like his pawn on D3 better than the knight. So this pawn is like absolutely untakeable. Um, and Noderbeck's just trying to thrash him. I mean, Abdul thinks that maybe Noderbeck is anticipating d3 from Ding, and then he's going to play knight d7 headed towards c5 with that knight, or e5, you know, but developing this piece. And remember what I said on the very first move? Some of you, some of you may have not been with us on the first move. Some of you will remember that on the very first move, I said that castling queenside was very undesirable. And when Noderbeck got the active queen on the queenside versus white, I said that that was very, very significant. All these things are going to come together when Noderbeck starts an attack on Ding's king. Because the person who's attacking, the person with the active queen supported by the bishops, it's going to be dramatic what can happen and against d3 another thing he could do is this move this move this move it may be too early for that but i think you can see my point i'm sacking everything to get my queen in and you know you can take this piece and then this comes in and that is very much Noderbeck's style <laughs> to calculate these kind of options at all all the time and see if they might not work. Um, actually, queen a3 is better, so you can take with check and avoid queen to b1. Um, oof. I think the, well, if you run, then there's rook d8. Oof. Folks, I don't, I don't think white has any has any defense here already. I think it's lost. And that was like that was a pretty aggressive, egregiously aggressive continuation I just played for black. I sacked both my center pawns and a knight. I wasn't confident it would work. It was just something I would I would calculate in a game. What does it do for me? Well, when first looking at that idea, I'm thinking to myself there's like a 10% chance it works. 5 to 10% chance that it works. Okay, would I put in a ton of effort on a 5% chance of trying to find a win? No. Those are positions where I don't look too hard at moves that try to win, right? But as the position sort of like complicated and unusual, when I look at this variation, um, when I look at this variation and try and check what it looks like, you know, not not expecting to find a win. The continuation is going to instruct me about the position. It's going to give me a sense. I'm going to notice some tactical themes. I'm going to see how creaky white's position is or isn't. I'm going to figure out how close I am or not to playing e4. Is it an issue that I'm letting all these pieces jump back to life or are they too slow? How fast are my th threats? All of this is going to inform the move that I eventually calculate and choose to play. Right, So that's why I would look at this in a game. And 
I mean, here instead of taking the knight, white could, you know, come back with queen b1 and maybe refute this idea, right? I, I'm not confident this idea works. Uh, maybe the knight is already stuck because of the bishop and the pawn, and we could just go, oh, but queen b1, black could trade and play rook e4, and the knight's not gone. So, you know, if this is the best white can do, you know, knight e2 can't move. And the bishops are exerting pressure. Black's better, but black can do better than this. All right? So, um, okay, so e4 and d3 is not winning yet. We found, like, a clear defense for white. But you see how it was still useful, right? We got... <laughs> we're getting closer to having a sense of what we're dealing with here, right? Um, we found the variations where white gets ravaged. We found a bailout move with queen b1. White's main resource in all these positions is going to be offering queen trades that prevent them from just losing on the spot. But we saw that black is still a bit better here with this essentially stupid continuation um, by me. And it's going to be much better to, to keep the tension and play probably like knight d7 like Abdul said. But we've got moves in this game, so let's see what they have played. We got bishop f5 check from Ding. Atrocious. Absolutely atrocious. Why would you ever take a less valuable piece that can never even get away or move with your more valuable piece when you've got weak light squares? I mean... Oh, I can't even, I, 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 mm, I didn't even want to talk about it. It's like, uh, it's so sad. There's no, there's no nice spin to put on it. And I've got a lot of experience commentating games played at a 1500 level. But, ah, uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. So then he plays like Abdul. He plays CD instead of D3. And Abdul said he would play CD first just to avoid these kind of pawn breaks. With black already having the pawn on F5, by the way, you know, if now he played D3, then E4 is all the all the more strong or plausible, right? All the stronger, all the plausible. -er -er. Um, but, oh, what a feeble, what a feeble, feeble line, right? And now all Nodirbeck has to do is overprotect this pawn and all white's minor pieces are dead. All of them, folks. All three of them. The only piece that wouldn't have been dead in this position is the piece on h3 that willingly traded itself with no need to. And how hard do you think it's going to be for black to overprotect this pawn? Black has the move c5. He's got a pawn majority over here. Once black has played king b8 and c5, you can resign. This game is already done. Nodirbeck is through. 2-0. And I, not trying to, not trying to over whatever it, you know, exaggerate or anything, but it's, uh, it's, it's, I, I want to make sure that it's crystal clear to you that you can just paint a picture that's just strategically done. I guess this knight can come over to c4, so it's not dead. It's only two minor pieces that are dead. I'm going to correct myself. We should be correcting ourselves very frequently in Fisher Random Chess because it's much more difficult and unusual. But two dead pieces is going to be enough. This position is just, just crushed with this extra space and the bishop pair. I mean, it's just it's just brutal. Okay, the knight heads over to c4. Try and keep the game afloat. Knight c7. What is that about? I mean, it looks like it's about playing knight b5, but is he going to trade his bishop for the knight? I considered knight c5 if he wanted to trade bishop takes c4, but I didn't consider here because now if knight c4, bishop c4, pawn c4, I guess you'd have to play knight a6 to keep that knight going. Oh, if D takes C4, he's got D3 winning a piece because the queen's on E1. So white would have to play B takes C4. I 
And sorry, I see we've got some comments in, in chat. I should pay attention to chat as well. I was just trying to, you know, follow the train of thought and analysis a little bit. So Shiragarov, Shiragarov says, I'm right about Fisher Random Chess, and you were surprised Jesse disagreed. Yeah. It's not a variant, it's real chess. Yeah. 100 percent And Ding was seen coughing a lot yesterday and seems sick. Yeah. That's too bad. Okay. So this move here, the obvious move that white wants to play is knight here. He's planning to take here. Let me show you this variation here that I referred to. The queen can take on e1 if white plays rook takes d3. So that seems to end the game. So white would have to take this way. And then I guess his plan is knight a6. Going to b4, king b1. And I don't really see a knockout for black. Um, but what if it was the most boring knockout of all time? Doubling rooks against the knight on e2. What if that were impossible for white to parry? Knight c4 has been played by Ding, by the way. What if you just doubled rooks on the e-file and white's stupid minor pieces couldn't cope? What would you say to that? That looks dead. The tears of chess corresponding to each rating level. Cool. Knight before first with threats on a2 and d3, something crazy like b5. I considered b5, Abdul, because Young David is still in my head, you know, giving me advice that I can no longer follow up on. <laughs> and he's screaming at me moves like B5. And I'm like, David, are you sure you don't want to like move your king off of the C file before you play B5? And he's like, well, maybe, but B5, rah! And then the new me says, but wait a minute. What if you just put your two rooks on the E file and then white resigned? Yeah, Liart, I wasn't sure if the rook should go to e6 or e7. I wasn't sure. Uh, knight takes d4, rook takes e1, rogues. Abdul will play rook e7 because Abdul's like, I'm covering the king. Rooks on the second rank are the best defensive piece. And Abdul apparently has a weakness for anyone out there who's going to play against Abdul. A weakness of being too defensive, too uh, conservative and cautious. Uh, but by the way, folks, it doesn't really matter if we play rookie six or rookie seven, we'll win either way. There's a queen on a5, rogues. This is, this is the point. White is just gonna lose on the e-file. They can never like defend these squares enough to survive here. It's literally, it's literally the game is over. I don't see the chat all like agreeing in unison yet, but so maybe I'm missing something or maybe my idea is like a little bit deep or something, but this is literally the end. Barring me really blundering something here. And by blundering, I mean some maneuver for white where they somehow, you know, get out of things. Like in theory, they've got one move here to abandon the knight. You could play bishop f2 and try and hold this square and let black double. You'll be tied up forever, I think, right? They've got one move where they could try and do this kind of a thing. Like this and say like, oh yeah, so you've got the file. You still need to find a way to win the game. You know? White can play queen d2. Yeah. And black could take or play knight b4. But I think even just taking is perfectly fine, right? Because you just can't move these anymore. And then what I will do as black next is I'll play knight b4, knight takes d3, for example, or something of that type. Like there's no way to 
extricate or defend in time. At a super GM level, it's just straight up winning. I know you guys might be like, like, are you maybe winning a pawn or something? I'm pretty sure this is just done. Um, pretty sure. Let's see what they're doing. Cause they've played a few moves. He didn't take on c4. Even though I thought that was his plan and I thought it was just cold winning. I'm going to computer check. Computer says, best move, bishop takes c4, winning. Ha! Forget about commenting. Put me in the tournament. Put me in the tournament. <laughs> bishop takes c4, winning. But by the way, I also noticed the computer said every other move is also winning. It's just the bishop takes c4, like completely done. Well, here's the thing. Noterbeck, he probably knows he's winning no matter what he does. And sometimes, you know, then how you, how you play it out is not, not always like a big reflection of skill, right? Because it's like you're following your approach or your idea and you're double checking it. You're not making sure that there's no other better way. It can be a matter of taste or just sort of your personal, like this is how I've won positions 20 times before. So I follow the way I know how, right? Um, like let's say I've got the wrong technique for checkmating with king and rook against king, right? Let's say I've got the wrong technique. But I've done it that way like 50 times. And then you have me in a high stakes game and I need to checkmate with king and rook against king. It would be perfectly logical for me to just do it in a way which I know cold, even if it's like the slower method or something, right? So. How do you remember lots of chess principles? I'm a beginner. Um, well, Grandmaster, Grandmaster beginner, uh, first of all, if you're a beginner, I've got a video for you. Would you be would you be interested in a single video that could get you from beginner to 1200? And it's not a 17 hour video. I do sometimes make really long videos. But here's here's my video I made for you. This should get you all the way there. Um, should get you everything you need. Um, how to remember lots of chess principles? Well. Um, Everybody remembers things differently. You know, you might remember them by writing them out by hand yourself. Someone else might remember them by listening to somebody reciting them. Maybe record them and listen to them on a, on a headset while you're sleeping. Uh, someone else is going to remember them by, by seeing them, etc. right? Um, for me, I sort of learned the principles just by spending a lot of time with chess, you know, and thinking about them and arguing about them. So I like to argue and I'm sort of very, you know, verbal and, and, and lingual. <laughs> so he says with a question mark, like he doesn't even know a word, but he's trying to say he's good at words. Um, so to me, like I'll say, you know, in this kind of position, uh, the you know, I'll say something like this. In a position like this, the first person who starts the pawn tension, there's so much tension, black won't be able to play copycat. There will be some variation that won't work for them. And then somebody else is going to argue with me about it, you know. And that's what I want. I want to get into an argument and we start arguing back and forth. And then I really solidify it and remember it. Another way some people remember things is by teaching it to someone else. So if you feel like you really understand um, why f5 shouldn't work for black here or something like that, you could try to teach it to somebody else once you think you've really learned it. And then that'll reinforce if you really have learned it. And they'll maybe ask questions or have things they don't understand and it'll force you to really um, be on top of your own understanding. That's cool, DL Borger. Uh, you know, I don't think everyone needs to play the knight or for anything like that. You know, I'm not an apostle for any particular approach to the openings. Um, but I will say that all the people who think that they're not good enough or advanced enough and the knight or is too complicated or needs too much opening theory, I want to categorically say that those people are wrong. Not because I want them to play the knight or, but I want them to feel free and capable of playing any opening they want. Right? That's what I want. So I want people 
to be able to play whatever they want and experiment with it. Man, it's like we're stuck watching the car wreck, right? When we should be watching Magnus versus Ferugia. How did this happen? Does the Night Earth have like 12 continuations? It's got a ton of possible continuations, Hako, but if you, but that that's not a reason that you can or can't play it. Your opponents aren't gonna know a million moves of theory either. Okay, thanks, Chika. I'm also learning the King's Indian Defense right now, GM Balls. balls um, and air conditioning. Um, I, <laughs> I just uh, studied Kostya's course on it last Thursday, uh, and I was going to be sparring it, but then this uh, Chess 960 tournament started, and so that's taking over for me for this week. The Notre Dame game, he's going a very, very complicated route. So knight e5 cuts off the bishop defending d4. White wants to get these pieces into the game. Um, knight b5 is kind of the more obvious response here, but then white does have a4. Right? So he plays c5, saying you can't take on d4 because the knight is blocking the hidden attack on the king, so he can actually play cd4. But he's allowing queen c5 with just massive, massive complications, right? Queen c5, queen a2, White takes on d4. All the white pieces come to life, except the king is sort of dead. So it's... But I'll say this, Grandmaster Beginner. You should not try to master the king's Indian defense if you're a beginner. You shouldn't be trying to study any opening. And you shouldn't use chessable to study either. So you need to stop everything you're doing and watch my video because you're wasting all your time and all your money. So thank goodness you came here. Please, please trust me. Okay, you've got a free course, good. So you're only wasting your time. It's still a waste, stop. No openings. He said he's trying to learn the King's Indian defense, Seth. Awesome. You're much, you're very, very strong for a beginner then. Either you're talented or you've already been playing for a bit. Um, but anyway, I made a video for you with all the advice of what you should do and shouldn't do. You could follow it and do great, or you could ignore me, but I'm going to stop talking about it now. <laughs> I'm not going to waste my time if you don't want to believe me. Um, Abdul says knight d5, bishop d4, knight b4. Instead of having played c5, yeah. I'm sure there's good courses on chessable. I'm sure there are. But as far as I know, like basically none of them are for an 800.
I see what you mean, Shirogorov. That makes sense for sure. Yeah, Ferugia is white against Magnus playing Knight H3. Several people, by the way, played Knight H3 yesterday, Shiro Gorov, right? Two players played E4 with Knight H3 in that game yesterday, which I think was correct, or looked strong to me at least. Have you analyzed the game yet, Hako, at all? Have you analyzed the game and submitted it? Yeah, Abdul, I mean, you're kind of, you're almost forced to take it. Like, if you keep playing passive moves as white, you're going to lose for sure. And Ding has taken it. And you're right, Noderbeck sometimes either bluffs or is, like, slightly over-aggressive or overconfident, right? Like, he sometimes does things that don't 100% work out. Um... Oh yeah, you don't have to notate every single move. By submitted, I mean like like felt like it was done and you showed it to someone else or you upload it if you're in the training program to our database so that other people can look at it. Um, but Hako, most people I know who struggle with annotating their games, it's because they're setting themselves too high a goal of what they're trying to achieve when they annotate the game. So they're trying to do something comparable to what they've seen Super Grandmasters submit to New in Chess or, you know, My Life in Games by Mikhail Tal or something like that. Like they're trying to do an annotation comparable to a super GM's work instead of an annotation compared to a 1700s work. So most commonly, not having seen a sample of your work and, you know, until you tell me more about your own experience, until you tell me more about your own experience, my first thought would be you might be setting yourself too high a goal, right? Like a goal that's not to do a, a 1700 level analysis, but to do like a 2400 or a 2800 level analysis. So bring it, bring it back down a bit. <laughs> I can try Shira Gaurav. You may have seen how well Jesse listens to me when we argue. <laughs> Right, so Seth, for you, I would set a time limit, which is also, you know, traditionally a useful thing for you to work on for your for your actual play as well, right? And by the way, for anybody who's who's been watching, I've been analyzing my games on stream, and I often like give myself a certain position from the game and reset a timer on myself and do my analysis of that position as like a 10 minute exercise keeping me from spending 20 hours on it, right? And increasing the intensity of the work I'm doing and providing good practice for my future games. Um, so Seth, uh, a chess clock for you, right? For any given, you know, for any given question you're investigating about one move on one position, set your clock to, you know, 10 or 15 minutes, work those 10 or 15 minutes and then write whatever conclusion you were able to reach within that time and move on to the next position or question from your game. Yeah, you can use a chess clock when you're grading students' papers too, if that takes you too long. <laughs> Jesse's a great friend to have, point nine.
You're welcome, Hako, and I hope that's useful. If you have further questions, keep going. <laughs> All right, let's let's check in on 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 this tournament's supposed goat. F5 was played. Oh, right, sorry. What goal would be attainable for your level? So, Haku, to give you like a perfect answer, I would have to see an example of what you've done so far, right? Because everybody's capabilities depend on uh, where they're at at the moment, right? And it's not just your rating, but it's also your analysis, experience, and skill, right? Like, have you annotated five games or 10 games? When you annotated your game, did you spend 20 minutes on it? or 60 minutes on it, or three hours on it, or like up to three weeks, like uh, like DL Borger was just saying, right? So based on that, you know what, I, I would have to set something that's within range of what you've done up till this point. But if you're fairly new to analyzing games and you're a 1700, then my advice to you, I was just writing this up, so let me go to my to my drive here and open this thing up. Here's my suggestion. I mean, Jesse's not necessarily on board with it, but um, my suggestion for your level is, at your level, it is time to start scrutinizing ourselves very closely, looking for our errors and trying to understand them. To keep this from being overwhelming, oh, sorry, are you 1700 FIDE, national rating, or chess.com or Lee Chess? Sorry, one more question. Fide. Okay, great. Then this is for you. To keep this from being overwhelming, we will start with a search for two errors in each game. You can look for them at moments of uncertainty during the game, suggestions from the opponent during a postmortem, and moves that you regretted before the game was over. Here's what you need to understand about a mistake. A mistake is only a mistake if there was another better move possible. A losing move without a better alternative is not a bad move, but a normal move in a bad position. To locate a mistake, you need to find an alternative move which you can prove provides a better evaluation. Next, you need to explain in words why the improvement is superior to the mistake you played. It could be because of a concrete variation or there could be some chess principle or principles at stake, such as not activating the king at the right time, leaving too many pieces undefended, or playing improving moves instead of striking when there was no longer any meaningful way to improve the position. Finally, you should explain why you think you made the mistaken move and did not see or rejected the strongest move. This is an important step because you need to begin to understand yourself to continue improving. And that starts with knowing what types of mistakes you tend to make in what situations and why. Uh, for your first couple game annotations, I would suggest that you spend 45 to 90 minutes, maximum 90, minimum 45, on finding those two mistakes in the game. Turn off the engine, you assume. Well, yes. If you use the engine, you'll be done in five seconds and you'll learn nothing. So 45 to 90 minutes, that's my minimum and maximum uh, till you get at least like two or three games under your belt and start feeling much better and more confident and happy about annotating your games. Right now, you're feeling very conflicted and worried about annotating your games. You're not confident that you're doing a good job of it or what you should be doing and you don't feel like you're having fun while you're doing it so it's it's like a pain point right and we want to get you more comfortable and get rid of the pain before we push you to do something super super uh to do things that are more and more difficult and take longer and longer we want you to have some success and some good feeling as you do it so you're trying to find two mistakes per game that's it so don't bother explaining everything about you know the opening or this or that or the other. Hunt down two mistakes. Go to places where you think it's more likely to be a mistake. Try and find an improvement. Once you've found two, done. Submit it. Move on, right? And you can put like I tried to find two mistakes. Here are the two mistakes I think I found. You know, move seventeen and twenty and and thirty five. And then when you submit it, other people can go and check and see if you know they think you found two mistakes or not. Good. Awesome. It is not DL Borger. That is an excerpt of a little segment that I wrote recently on the subject. 
Look at Ferruja's clock starting to get a little bit low. I don't know how far they are into the game, but we'll try and catch up. So Magnus played FE5. Remember, I said EF5 here stops immediately the, uh, the symmetry, right? Because of this variation, remember? But I said that my instinct was that the best move would be FE5. And that's what he played. Black's going to go FE4. He's going to trade on F8, knight F8. And here I wasn't confident about getting a big advantage for white. You would want to play knight c4, but the bishop's on it now. I don't know if knight g4 is a possible move because we didn't spend long enough on this. The simple move is queen takes e4. Played. Black's definitely going to go queen e5. And now I thought queen a4 would be slightly annoying. But Magnus hits a different spot. So he's probably calculated that castle's queenside d4 is going to drive the black queen somewhere bad, or knight c4 there, or knight g4 there, hitting the queen and the a7 pawn and the knight. Ooh, so black can't castle queenside here. b6, gets the tempo kicking the queen. Is that a big enough advantage to take on a5? It's a pretty big advantage. The alternative is queen d6. I mean, queen a5, ba5, black's going to have rook b8 and just push that a pawn trying to trade it or do some damage to your structure. The a2 pawn is sensible, sensitive, sensible, sorry, I didn't translate properly fast enough, quickly enough. Um, let's look at the alternative of queen d6, because not immediately thrilled about queen a5. Queen d6... We always have to watch out for bishop b3 check now. Black can't castle queenside because the knight. They can't challenge our queen very easily. The queen seems well placed on d6. Bishop a2, king b, king c2, bishop b3, king b1, queen h5. Knight f4. Queen d6, bishop a2, knight c1 wins, right? No, queen h5, check g4. Yeah, okay. So I think queen d6. Nope. He magnuses his way to the end game. And then sacks a pawn to lock out one of the black bishops. That's not going to be good enough, is it? That's not going to be good enough. I don't know about that judgment, Magnus. What do you guys think about queen d6? I mean, has he gotten a little into like the habit of preferring the endgame grind? Queen d6. Bishop b3 just loses to knight c1. So knight e6. Now there's no hanging piece here. And so this knight could move out next. White can't castle queenside, it's true. Ah, uh, but this knight move allows knight c4, which is pretty strong. Liart says that there's going to be knight c2 for Magnus here.
Oh, look, there's chess.com French and chess.com Spanish and chess.com German all streaming. Chess.com German is following Vincent Keima versus Levon Aronian by the Freestyle Challenge. And in France, they're doing Ali Reza Firouja face à Magnus Carlsen au Freestyle Chess. Running D7, trying to stop Bishop E6, mainly preparing threats against the isolated D7 pawn. <coughs> so why would you play knight f4 and let black start moving before you've got your bishop on h3? Like, why would you ever do that? You're in charge, right? You pick the timing. <laughs> How much more of this precious chess 960 time do we have before school gets out? I've got a full hour before I even need to start walking. Maybe an hour and five or ten minutes. Oh. Beautiful. Um, somebody mentioned about this position that it felt like a Fabiano position, and I completely agree. Fabiano is, is actually very good at taking space advantages and squeezing the opponent back and, and slowly winning these kinds of positions. He's super good at it. Plays well in um, Roxy Binds, Symmetrical Englishes. All those kind of positions where you want to slowly expand and improve your position, he's actually phenomenal at. And this feels like a position that he would win. Barring the fact that it's a two-game knockout match and he might you know, bail out with some drawing line just to win the match at some point. But overall, it feels like a position he would win. I think. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm genuinely having you know the best time of of my life for today, Shira Garov. So there it is. We're enthusiastic. You think Fabi's going to be the next world championship challenger? Yeah. But you can't be super confident of it, right? Like the chances in the candidates are like, you know, he might have a 3% better chance than somebody else. And it's going to be, you know, he's got an 18% chance and someone else has a 16% chance and someone else has a 14% chance, et cetera, et cetera, right? It's all kind of all kind of guesswork. Okay, the game we have seen the least of, Cartier asks if Levon is winning. Last time we saw this, it was move seven and we were really struggling to find moves for, for Kamer. A4. Unnecessary, but fine. 96 blocking the bishop and the patience oh and came or lashing out feeling so uncomfortable knight comes in just ignoring f4 situation the move looks creative and deep i don't know what's going on just honestly i can't keep up with this what is this about It's not bishop takes b7, knight c5, right? It's not knight b7, knight b7. There's nothing there. What? What is he on about? I'm not... I just don't know. I mean, I can see if knight c5, bishop c5, he's saying, you know, there's a positional threat to trade on d6 and black's awkward there. I can see that. But what if black just played gf4? I don't know why black keeps attacking a pawn that was already seemingly hanging. And he can play e3 now and just sort of kill these pieces. Oh no, his knights on c5 is hanging. So what did he do? There must be more moves. I just need to refresh, huh? Maybe he castled and that's why my, why my thing stopped working there. Yes, castles. It always breaks the relay. Oh, so that was missing already here before knight c5. He just castled in this position. gf4 was played. Knight c5 just leaving that pawn hanging. Wow. Okay, so now we can see that from this position, what he's looking at is he's looking at going after d7, right? Because he's got this rook to loose in that direction. So his threat here is something like knight c4. If black played fg3, I mean, he just completely does not care about that. Just keeps hammering on the d file. And it looks fairly brutal 
against black. Black can't move the B pawn without sacking an exchange. Can't get castled either way. Oh, this G5 was atrocious, by the way. Just atrocious. Completely not dealing with the needs of the position. <laughs> now you spent two moves on your G pawn while white castled queenside and started preparing checkmate on D7. Gets out of the way. Third move over there. Good lord. I'm surprised he didn't play knight c4 and end things right here. Queen g3. I mean, other moves you could play would be e4. Just tearing everything apart. But what about knight c4? Then there's knight c5 hitting our queen and bishop takes c4. Yeah, we can't quite do it. So some knight move should be good though, right? Maybe knight b3, backing up the other one. Vish likes e4. I'm sort of surprised to see him recapture. I feel like he was just going to checkmate and ignore <laughs> ignore Kamer's pawn. Hope that he just you know spent the next six moves moving it. <laughs> yeah, Vincent is not going to coordinate this game. Whoever said that Levon was probably winning was probably, was probably right. G takes h2 and knight c5 would be hanging. Yeah, I just thought I'd be ready to checkmate by then, Bish. You know, like I wanted to go knight c4, but I hadn't calculated knight c5, bishop c5, bishop takes c4. But I wanted to go knight c4, and then against any move like gh2, I go knight takes d6, and then I'm taking on b7. I just thought I was there in time. Um, but knight b3 would defend that knight and allow us to answer g takes h2 with bishop takes h2. So knight b3 looks okay. On knight c4 foos, I think black had knight takes c5 hitting our queen. And then when we take back bishop here, keeping the file closed for the moment. So it's an inadvertent piece sack. It opens up the rooks. It might still win. Who knows? But okay, at least we can understand why he did this. Defending. And this is the live position. So for example, queen g5 check, king has to go to c8. The game's not done yet, but black's queen is trapped, right? That's the piece that completely can't get out. Every other piece is technically in the game, but that queen... Like queen g5, king c8, rook g1. Threatening to just take on g8. <laughs> that would be fun. And of course, as white dragon says, just e4, just trying to tear things open makes sense. But maybe black, maybe, just maybe black could play knight e4 then. So Levon is thinking a little bit about that. Uh, this game, queen c4 was played, as predicted. And nobody back let the queens trade. This is the only scenario with winning chances for ding. <sighs> okay, but the bishop can never take the knight. That much is clear. Be very confident in this here. Yeah, he's got to draw knight d5. Okay, that match is over. Um, so yeah, Noterback fails to win another incredibly winning position, but you know, does advance pretty confidently against um, against Ding. Uh, and for Ding, thank goodness the tournament's over, I think we could say. Yeah, that was weak-ish. I mean, I feel like I could have won that position for, for Black. 
Um, all right, Cartier saying E4 has been played. Okay, and Abdul has a line. Uh, Abdul says knight E4, bishop takes, pawn takes, rook takes is lovely. If they finish a match tied 1-1 G-Cod, they play a rapid tiebreak. Check. And whichever way the king goes, we've got the back rank mate, right? That's the problem with the queen. Just a nice little tap on G5. It's lovely. It's simple. It's not flashy. It's just a lovely touch. So E4 is played, and Vincent has not yet moved. Um... If we wonder what white's threatening, so one possible move from white would be e5, kicking the knight. It's not fully crushing. You could play e f5, rook e1, queen e1, knight f5, queen e5, and that would be game over. Just bring your queen to h8. There's no way to deal with that <clears throat> wherever the knight goes. Um, so he's threatening e takes f5, just picking up a pawn and then, you know, starting to try and checkmate the black king from the right side of the board, you know. Uh, go after the g8 bishop and the back rank. Uh, this move should be crushing. Yeah. Can black survive here with bishop e6? A very logical move. They would lose at least a pawn, right, Liar? Bishop e6. White could trade on d6. Rook takes. Rook takes. Pawn takes. E takes f5. Oh no, bishop f5 is check! Okay, sorry. Let me correct that. I'll go queen g5 check first. King c7, pawn takes f5, bishop a2 check, king a2, rook e1, and black is fine. Um, <laughs> okay, bishop e6, bishop e6. Queen h4 check instead of queen g5, haha, <laughs> keeping the rook defended. So, Bishop e6, bishop d6, rook d6, rook d6, pawn d6, queen h4, king c7, e takes f5. Bishop takes f5, check, king a2. Hmm, game goes on again. All right, Borger gives us queen g5, king c8, pawn takes f5, bishop f5, check, queen takes f5, rook takes e1, check. King moves to a2, knight takes f5. Hmm. Okay, well, bishop e6 looks like a, a reasonable move given the position. Yeah, this, the queen g5 ef5 line, I think, is not very good after black goes bishop a2 check with the trade in. Um, maybe you could do it with not the trade in because you'd have some kind of counterattack on the back rank. But I don't see it yet.
yet see the win against bishop e6. Nor even like, you know, the good continuation, even if it's not winning. Okay, I've got a super lame continuation that's pretty good. Bishop e6, queen h4 check, king c8, queen takes h7. Vish against bishop takes d6, black plays rook d6. Black never goes bishop a2 check until white's played e takes f5, right? So bishop d6, rook d6, rook d6, c d6, e f5, bishop a2. Or bishop f5 in that case, queen f5, rook e1 is winning. That's why I had to put the queen on h4 to, def to defend the rook. But then there's bishop f5. Yeah. Yeah, so I think against bishop e6, we go queen h4, queen h7. And then when black plays knight e4, we just, uh, oh, we can't take twice? We can't, yeah, we just take twice. And we just keep playing that position. Just a position where the black queen is on b8, and now we've got a passed h pawn. You know, we haven't fully knocked black out, but we're, we're preserving our position. Yeah. All right, let's see what Magnus is up to. A3, bishop f7, knight f4, g5, doesn't trade, comes around, long maneuver like we thought, d6. I guess he's planning to lodge the bishop on e5 to try and hold things together, is uh, Ali Reza. Yeah, he's got to, because bishop h3, you know, rook e1, I mean, he'd be under a lot of pressure on those squares, but yeah, he's got, uh, he's got bishop e5. What about knight to g4 here, instead of e4? Yeah, Liart. Black will have to do something like that, but it'll be a bit desperate, right? Like, we expect white will still be better. But yeah, I think that's what to do. Knight g4 looks very good. Note that Ferusha has used an hour and 15 minutes on the first 20 moves and has another 20 moves to make in 14 minutes. I don't think they have the 30 second increment yet. At least the tournament info didn't say that they did. I think Shirogorov must be joking, Vish, because like black is super super far from <laughs> from domination i think it's kind of a joke well he had to do something abdul no i mean he had to do something it's very hard to sit and do nothing very very hard
position is almost domination from white. So for black to have a plan to dominate is, is funny, <laughs> right? Hello, Steinke. Yes, Q, yes, indeed. I mean, let's enjoy this one now, but yes, let's do more. Let's do more. Move queen d3. Like, he can play e4 countering what Kamer's doing and keeping, like, a pleasant position for white, but he recognized that Kamer's position was just set up to trade on e4 and then untangle this bishop and that he couldn't do much else, and so he just left e4 hanging over Vincent here. And completed development, you see? And castled and said, sure, take that stuff. And now he's starting to bring, like, the attack. And he's got to be more precise here with the calculation. But very, very strong. And then e4 was great. He could also have played e4 earlier. There was a move. right? Maybe, like, right here, e4 is also, like, interesting. But whatever, he did it his way. And... Oh, the slaughter... A slaughter. Ah! Oh! I love how he left that e4 move hanging over black. That was really, I learned something from that in the opening there. I was just like, what useful moves does black have? It was a very, very awkward moment for black. And the last game we, see, we still have going, folks, is uh, Carlson versus Ferruja. And um, here, Magnus traded off that bishop. So now he's got the bishop pair as well. Trades off one of the doubled A pawns. Advances the king. He's got the bishop pair and the structural advantage. I mean, he's got a lot. You reached your peak rating missing made in one for four consecutive moves. <laughs> that's that's a funny way to set a record, so you know. <laughs> um, I mean, Magnus has superlative technique for these kind of positions. Uh, it looks like Magnus versus Ferruja might be the only tiebreak we get today as well. Just FYI, everybody. Um. All right, I've sent Aronian versus Kamer to uh, to Jesse and Costia. And let's let's go back to the game that I wanted to focus on from the beginning, but um, but we're getting back around to it. Technically, you get to graduate, but you should still finish the maiden ones. <laughs> Uh, does Magnus want to bring Rook to A file? Maybe. He may also want to play B5. You know, kick the knight, play bishop takes A7, and then promote his B pawn. He's definitely working on promoting the B pawn. Yeah, I mean, fine as this position is for Maggie, you know, knight G4 might have been equally good. It's hard to say. I don't really know what black would do about knight g4 either. So. Uh, Maggie is uh, Magnus Carlson. <laughs> mm. 
You can also call him Maggie Pants. Magtown, Magalicious, Magnum. All right, Rook B8. So that's the move that wants to play A5. Magnus. Yeah, I've heard people call him Magnus. That's true. All right, so A5 is, is a big threat. It's the kind of move I wouldn't know what to do about and the kind of move that Magnus would have something ready for. I mean, right now I'm looking at bishop f1, which is pretty lame. How would Wesley and Hikaru do in this event? I don't know. Probably, probably they'd be competitive. I'm looking at knight c7 here, but then I guess on knight before you'd have knight e6 check. Yeah, it's not something that we love, but remember what I said long ago that this was black's best piece. Trading it wouldn't be bad. That knight is a chump? Oh, I thought it was black's best piece. Defending their weak pawns on the queen side. If we went knight c7, knight c7, bishop takes c6, then the point is after a5 to play rook d7. And suddenly white's just hyperactive and black's dying. The knight on c6 isn't going anywhere. It's just annoying us by defending stuff. Knight c7, I'm going to take it seriously. Knight c7, knight b4, knight e6, bishop e6, cb4 is winning. Um, knight c7, knight c7, bishop c6. There's no way to stop rook d7, so I'm going to say that's winning as well. Knight c7 is winning. And he plays it! All right, we got it. Those of us who wanted to play knight c7. Those of us who didn't want to play knight c7 did not get it. <laughs> that knight is not a star on b5. Not a star. So rook d7. King g6 is the plan bishop e4 resign what is the what is black's next move after rook d7 i said it was black's best piece i mean you can decide whether or not it's good to be the best piece on your team the reason it was the best piece is because it was defending the a pawns for the last like you know 10 moves it's been black's best piece now, also, mind you, that's on a bad team, right? That would be like if you had LeBron on your Little League team or something like that. Your team might be really bad, and then LeBron would be your best player. I guess that's not a good example because he would be your best player on another team as well. But you know what I mean. Like, it was the best of, you know, not a very strong bunch. But it was the best piece. And basically, this was the... This was... You know, we had sort of a maneuvering phase here where we were watching the game nose nose and we were saying, what should white do with this piece, right? We find white's worst piece and we ask ourselves, what should we do with it? What's the best square we could bring it to? And I said, a second way of approaching this position is what is black's best piece and can we trade it off? And the answer is this piece. If we trade off this piece, then suddenly black has to defend a7 and a5 and you'll notice pretty quickly there's like no way to do it it's just like instantly everything falls apart 
So that was sort of the strategic approach to this position is like, we need to take this piece and either move it somewhere where it applies pressure to black or try and trade off black's best piece. Magnus eventually traded it for black's dark squared bishop, but even that didn't make like obvious progress to my sort of much lower level of, uh, you know, technique. Like to me, his position is obviously still better, less pawn islands, bishop pair, but I wasn't yet sure how he's winning the position um, until black allowed knight c7. And then I, I, yeah, now I can see how to continue. I don't remember the game, knows, knows, but it sounds like it. <laughs> Hmm. He's thinking a bit before going rook d7. I don't see any defense for black, any meaningful defense after rook d7, which threatens, just to be clear, threatens bishop d5 and bishop takes a7, both winning. Bishop h6 check would also be winning once the rook's on d7, but not as easy. All right, king f6, yeah. So hanging this pawn, but king g6, bishop e4 was pointless. Right, so Zeno, if you, you're right, you winning the a7 pawn is, is big, right? But you'd rather not do opposite colored bishops, so play bishop a7, not bishop takes. Um, b5 if you if you have the choice right and here bishop takes b5 if black tries something like bishop e8 bishop e6 whatever you always have at least rook to d6 so yeah so bishop a7 is correct keeping same colored bishops right huh i actually got this technical phase right if magnus is getting it right because he's playing all the same moves i would want to play bishop g6 looking to get some counterplay from the e pawn now, the move rook a6 is interesting, and so is b5, and so is... No, 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 I'm, I'm not very good at him, especially not as uh, in like an endgame position. Also, king c1 to d2. That could be like, that could be some technique. Do you guys see what I'm saying? I can't I can't draw arrows without a mouse. I'm a sad man without a mouse here. Um you just control the e3 square and then you say, you know, I've got two connected fast pawns still. Sometimes that's all you have to do, and then it's just like, well, yeah, why am I still playing for black? Whew. Yeah, rook c8 b5 and rook d8 rook d7. Right? And then I just play king d2, king e3, and you can resign in peace. Now you can also try and calculate a, for, a forced win, right? Like b5, e4, rook a8, rook a8, bishop a8, e3, b6, e2. Doesn't seem to win and I, I... Is rook a1 too slow? Rook a1's playable, but it's to me it's the wrong direction. Your rook is great, right? Which piece of yours is bad? The king. Let's improve our worst place piece. King c1 to d2. Wow. Rook a6 is also very annoying. It was one of my first thoughts here, Cartier, would be rook a6. Just harassing the heck out of three undefended things on the same file. You don't need to prevent rook b6 though, Hako, because if I go king c1 and you go rook b6 and I go b5, then I'm just going to go c4, c5 to tempo you or I'll play rook a6, right? And if you trade, b takes a6, a7, a8, etc. I'm having a good day, Shirogorov. I'm feeling good. I'm feeling good. I don't know if I'm getting all the moves right, but I, but I'm enjoying this. And I did catch a couple Magnus moves just now. B5, Bishop, D3. King, C1, Rook, B6, B5, Bishop, D3. Ooh, annoying. B5, 
rook b6, king c1, rook b6, b5, bishop d3. That would force me to play rook a5, I think, and then king d2 and, and, and fix things. All right, so rook a6 played. The king steps off of the file like it has to. That was a nice catch, Hako. I think that that bishop d3 move was pretty annoying. We could put it on the board and just have a quick look. King c1, rook b6. Now, white's got moves other than b5 as well if bishop d3 is a problem. But let's have a quick look here. I feel like the only thing I have is rook here, and black should try to put the king on c5. That would be a defensive resource. And... Yeah, and I'm not happy. They're getting close, Resonance Spectre. It looks like we're on move 35 here. So they've got five more moves to make. Um, oh, Magnus has played another move. Rook back to a8. Interesting. Huh. Interesting. So he chased the king one step further away from his b-pawn, so it can't come back in defend against rook b6 there's still b5 bishop d3 looks annoying right so against rook b6 it's rook b6 maybe he'll just play bishop d5 as i was saying like it, with my king c1 move rook b6 you don't have to um you don't have to go b5 right you can play a move like rook c7 or something and you're good you can play bishop b7 perfectly fine, right? The idea is to bring the king here and go rook a6. And uh, I think this is like a pretty good continuation for white, right? I'm pretty much in control here. Yeah, move 35, Shirogorov. Or 36 maybe was just played. Yeah, 36 was just played, rook a8, rook b6. Now we're live, four moves to play. Yeah, they're they're fine. They'll make time control. Um <laughs> What's he going to do now? He could play bishop e8. He could play bishop d5. He could play rook c8. It's not super, super easy. It's not super, super easy. I feel like he's not, even he's not like 5,000% sure what to do here. I like my king c1 idea, kind of married to it, but okay. I would guess there's more than one way, but sometimes it's a little tricky to pin down exactly how to do it. I don't know the format for the tiebreaker, Zeno. Sorry, I'm not a fully professional commentator here. So Steinke, somebody pointed out that against b5, bishop d3 is a bit annoying. So... Magnus thinking. Normally you wouldn't want to trade bishops, but this endgame is winning as a rook ending or a bishop ending. So we don't need to be stereotyped against bishop e8. It's a playable move. He goes for b5. Oh my goodness. So then bishop d3, he'll have to play rook a5. And then it feels like a bit of a mess. Bishop d3. It's a slightly better version g -ka. Yeah, just mildly better because the king is a step away. And he plays rook a5. But the thing is, like, he didn't, 
in my version, he would have had the move king c1, which was useful towards coming around this way. But I don't see how to fully like break this situation. I think now his plan is probably to bring the king up and push this pawn. And when this pawn gets to e2, play rook a1. I think that's the new assignment of the white pieces. And the black king being a step away can't get to c5. So black's going to run that pawn. King b3, e3, c4, e2, rook a1. Something like that is the plan now. Magnus thinking, that's 38 moves. There's only two moves to go. Six minutes versus two minutes. I can't believe I thought of that king c1 move. That's like the not me move. That is like absolutely how I've never, ever, ever played chess or ever seen a move like that in my own game. He's played king b3. Not necessarily, Hako, because white might literally be queening these pawns. So white might be able to sack a full rook for black's e-pawn and still win. I mean, at this point, it's really just endgame technique. You know, it's not like anything particular to 960. You, you look at this position, you've got no reason to think it's chess 960 particularly, right? If you look at this, you might suspect chess 960 when you see that queen. But when you look at this position, I mean, you know, it could have been anything. It could have been a Sicilian. <laughs> All right. So I think he needs c4 to free up the rook. Yeah, it was move 40, but he still played it instantly. Oh, well, he had six minutes, played it instantly. Rook A1's coming in one more move, Hako. Yeah, one more move. You have to play C4 to free the rook. Um, I don't know if Kostya's awake yet, F6. Yeah, Skywalker, this is 960. Yeah, if you didn't see the beginning, it could just be any chess game, right? Perfect. <laughs> Jesse's up, but he doesn't want to show up <laughs> for this yet. <laughs> He's still digesting Shiro Gorov's uh, salvo, which I sent him. King f5. So he doesn't push the pawn to e2 yet. So now white has a choice between king c3 or king b4. I think c5 might not be good, right? c5, e2, rook a1, rook takes b5. You couldn't be sure that you're winning there, could you? There's some risk that this would be a way to mess it up. Small risk. Eric is, in a, is protesting. <laughs> um, king c3, e2... Rook a1 looks crushing. King c3, king e4, bishop takes king. King c3, bishop e4. C5. It's like just, just barely winning, I guess. Mildly risky. I think king c3 might be even better than king b4 here. Also, white could play rook a8 since black didn't play e2, forcing the rook to a1. I remember, like, on this move, I was thinking, like, do we have time to go rook a8, e2, rook e8 instead, right? Because that's even, that's so much better than a rook on e1, right? Then we're not talking about sacking our rook for that pawn. But rook a8, bishop takes b5, it wasn't fast enough. So after king f5, you'd have to think that rook a8 is game over, as well as king c3. If black's king were one step closer, Gcot, then when you go for 
this rook a5 move, the king could get to c5 in time to blockade the c-pawn. And so you'd play a longer game. Like, we had looked at this kind of an option like here. See? In this line, the black king gets to c5 against the king on c1 and with the king closer. So in this version, white shouldn't play b5. If they play king c1, then against rook b6, they should play something like rook c7 or bishop bishop b7, I think, was maybe my best move. Because there I'm going rook a6 and king d2. You're, you're done here as black, I think. I, I think this move's good enough. It's very weird to block off your rook like that, but I, I'm pretty confident I, I'm winning right here uh, with this approach. But b5 would be the wrong approach with king c1 because the black king can get to c5. But the way Magnus played with rook a6, the king goes one step further away, and now he does go for b5, and he sees that king f6, king b3, king e6, king b4, the white king gets control of c5. Black doesn't get the blockade, and his rook can come back to a1 in time to defend against the e-pawn. So this is the live position. He's still thinking on it, but I think rook a8, king c3, and king b4 are all technical wins here. The only move I'm not sure of that might be a little bit of a trap is this c5 move. Oh, what I put Hako was this move, e2. And I was just sitting here, by the way, just now calculating rook b5, which is hilarious. You guys see this line? <laughs> but it's it's unnecessary because white can go here. And if you go king here, then there's rook b8, right? And if you go somewhere else, there's like rook e5 or c7 and u queen and white queens. So I... It's what I was just sitting here, like my brain just turns on things, but my original idea was e2 threatening to queen, rook has to come back, and now an exchange sack. And I'm not 100% sure that white wins this one. Probably they do. Put the rook on e1, king b4, poke the bishop, move the c-pawn. If you trade the c-pawn for the e-pawn, you still have enough to win two on two on the king side. It's still winning for white. Even this is winning for white, I think. Yeah, doesn't matter too much, but why do I think King C three is better than King B four? I think they're I think they're more or less equally winning. Awesome, Grandmaster Beginner. Awesome. We'll see you at twelve hundred in no time. Wow, 35, nice. Uh, so JK, Heidegg, I'm not sure if King C3 or King B4, if one is better than the other. I think they're both winning. <clears throat> King C3 wins by just sort of hitting this bishop and it's got nowhere good to go. King B4 wins by just defending B5 and then pushing C5 and just letting the rook deal with the A pawn. And you can also win with rook a8 to e8, and you just cover the e-pawn from there and then take your time bringing up the king and the c-pawn. So, Hako says rook a8 is like the one where he would just resign, or he or she or they would just resign against rook a8 because now there's just nothing left to do. Rook on b6 can't move, e-pawn gets covered from e8, you don't, GM. You think you do, but you don't. <laughs> Abdul is also impressed by Rook A8. 
Mm, no, maybe, maybe I misspoke something as well, J.K. Heidegg, but my original thought was that he was playing king b3, king b4, rook a1, and c5. But black played king f5 when we expected... Black played king f5 when we expected that the line would be, you know, e2, rook a1. By playing king f5, I suddenly thought, oh, well, white's got an extra tempo, right? Since the rook doesn't have to rush to a1. So with that extra tempo, what are the other options white could play? And I'm like, oh, there's king c3 hitting the bishop. There's rook a8 getting behind. Those both look totally winning too. Have I considered extending the knight or starter repertoire to make like an extended kid? That would be for 1800 plus, right, Claw? Are you over 1800 already? Is this question relevant? If you pre-move resigned when Magnus sat down, you would have missed winning the game yesterday against him. <laughs> Ferruja beat Magnus yesterday. Magnus is the one in the must-win situation. Um, he's been thinking like nine or 10 minutes on this move, unless they've already resigned the game and it's just not updated. Should I refresh? No, not missing anything, still thinking. The other answer to your question, Claw, is it is not anywhere near my priority to make like an advanced knight or repertoire, to go from the starter repertoire to an extended repertoire for 1800 plus players. I'm not like a big fan of, of opening theory or advancing opening theory. As you can see, here I am having a lot of fun without any opening theory today. <laughs> so it's it's very far from my priority. I have like a couple uh, different kinds of opening repertoires I wanted to present at the 1200 to 1800 level um, to give to give people some more starter options so they can pick what suits them and then build off of it if they want to, uh, which I can do which I can do much faster than making an extended repertoire. I think making these like advanced opening courses is so much work and honestly almost pointless for anybody involved. The person making the course, the person reading the course or studying the course. Yeah, you've got two bands to go. So I think what I what I offered is plenty. <laughs> I don't know much more than what I offered, Claw. And I just played the Night Orf against two GMs at my last tournament and didn't lose a game. So you 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 really like for what purpose do you need any more than than my starter repertoire? I I literally like don't have any more moves memorized than are in that starter repertoire. I would have to go like, you know, do research to put more in. All that I have more than that is like more experience. I've logged more sparring games, so to speak, already than other people have with that opening. So then I play it well. Um, my thoughts on the bird it's uh, it's an okay opening I mean I've gradually realized it's not quite as good as e4, d4, c4 and knight f3 um, the last time I played it I got a really bad position against somebody who had like booked up against the bird um, But I've also gotten good positions with it before and had plenty of interesting games with it. I mean, it should be it should be borderline playable, but it certainly doesn't get an opening advantage. You can play it if you want to, though. I mean, you can you can play it. There's no reason you can't play it. You want a safety blanket claw? How about me telling you you're good enough and you don't need any more moves? And spend that time you would have spent learning more variations just playing some more sparring games in in your opening it'll pay off more is it more playable than the polish it's probably comparable to the polish hako i think b4 is perfectly fine for white as well like f4 
like I don't know a black advantage against B4, and I don't really know a black advantage against F4. They're pretty comparable. Oh shoot, my kids! Uh, Magnus finally played Rook A8. I think that's a great move, and it's going to be the win uh, for Magnus, and there's going to be a tie break that I can't stick around to show you. Sorry, guys. Uh, have a great day. Um, let's raid Chess24 so you can watch their coverage of the rest of this. Uh, cheers. Peace out. Be well. Um, my kids don't have school tomorrow, so I'll see you all on Wednesday. And I'll cover this tournament on Wednesday, Thursday, Friday as well. Cheers, everybody.